Oh, okay. So good evening and welcome. How many of you in the room are foodies? Welcome foodies, we're happy to see you. So uh, it's fall of 2006 and a small group of food entrepreneurs at the Food Innovation Center were having great fun in developing their products and getting ready to take their product to the marketplace. And one of the things that was happening back then was it wasn't really known exactly how to do that. And so the Small Business Development Center came together with the Food Innovation Center and said, hey, let's work together and we'll bridge that gap between product development and business development and we'll help you get your commercial ready product into the commercial marketplace. And that's how Getting Your Recipe to Market was born. I'm Tammy Marquez Oldham. I'm one of those food entrepreneurs who was at the Food Innovation Center at that time taking my food product into the marketplace. And today I'm the director of the Small Business Development Center. How did that happen? <laughs> really happy to be here with all of you today. So what has happened in all those years since the fall of 2006? Well, uh, what we thought was going to be a program for a small group of food entrepreneurs became something much bigger. It became more like a movement. And 300 food entrepreneurs later, I'm happy to say to you this program is more in demand than ever before. We've had food entrepreneurs fly weekly for 12 weeks from Reno, from Sacramento, uh, from Southern California, um, all the while really enjoying the aspect of being together. So today we have a, a great moment in time where you as foodies who maybe have already <coughs> taken your food product into the marketplace or have a recipe and you're thinking about it, you're going to have a unique opportunity to talk to some food entrepreneurs who have done that before you. And my job today for you is just as moderator to ask a few questions, but we're going to have plenty of time for you as well to ask the questions that you would like to ask. So I'd like to start by having each of our panelists, welcome panelists, introduce yourselves, tell us a little bit about yourselves and your business and your products. And Rebecca, let's start with you. Okay, my name is Rebecca Kawanami. I have a company called River Wave Foods. Uh, we are the creators of a line of different ethnic sauces. I brought some samples. So. Um, the food journey for me started um, very serendipitously. I had been a flight attendant for Delta for about 29 years. And um, it, it, at some point, because we had closed our bases and I was commuting to Salt Lake, it was time to make a change for, in my career. So a friend of mine who was from Thailand had had this sauce, and I, and I thought it was a brilliant idea that she should market it. Well, to make a long story short, she had no interest in marketing it, and somehow it took on a life of its own. And the end product for that sauce was um, the Mai Tai Gourmet sauce, and this is how it all started. And then um, Pam Kramer, who has a company called Dulcet, was also, had been also a flight attendant for Delta, and she introduced me to Tammy. And then that just, again, it took on a life of its own. I signed up for one of the early uh, Getting Your Rest to Market classes, and uh, in the interim was developing more product. And in 2008, we went into the uh, retail market, but along the way we were in some farmers markets, and slowly over the years, it's just, it's been growing. Well, thank you for being here and being willing to share your wisdom about your journey. And Josh? Hello. Hello. Thanks, Jimmy. Um, I'm Josh Fiegels. Uh, my business is called Jude's Foods, and I, I love what you say about it taking on a life of its own, because uh, if you've ever started a business or as you're thinking about starting a business, it really is uh, like uh, you're creating something out of nothing, and then it, and then it becomes almost a living being. Um, I've got three kids of my own, and then Jude's Foods is my fourth kid. And, yeah. um, but what inspired us to go down this path was actually my eldest son, Jude. He has uh, autism and sensory processing disorder and a number of other health concerns. And through his journey, we discovered a gluten-free, dairy-free lifestyle that uh, he found great benefit from, I also found benefit from. And so it was over the course of figuring out how to, how to bake and how to cook and to live this new lifestyle uh, that we created these recipes. 
and um, and then ended up deciding, well, what, what should we do with this? Maybe we should sell it. And, and I found the Food Innovation Center, and then I found Getting Your Recipe to Market, and, and then that really, um, you know, sort of took all the momentum that had naturally come out of our, our home kitchen and out of our enthusiasm for uh, what we were discovering, and, and it helped us to learn how to create a business. So. Oh, and I guess I should say we sell chocolate chip cookies, gluten-free <laughs> chocolate chip cookies, so which which are out uh, out with the rest of the food if you if you haven't tried them. Thank you, Josh and Erin. Welcome. Can you tell us a bit about you and your business? Yep, my name is Erin Keller, and um, I make one product in four flavors, and it's creme brulee. And I guess uh, the whole way I got started, I've been cooking for a really long time. I was the line cook in Portland for I don't know, maybe seven or eight years, and um, I moved back to Northern California a few years ago where I grew up. I wanted to start my own business and I thought I'd kind of test out the waters in the small town I grew up in. And I was doing wood-fired pizza at um, the farmer's market. I had like a little mobile pizza oven. And um, I have always had like a passion for baking and pastry but never had done it professionally. And I wanted to sell something to complement the pizza just as like a sweet or something to kind of up the check price and so I uh, I wanted to make something you know sweet but I wanted to sell something that none of the other vendors at the farmers market were selling everybody had cookies and pound cake and you know stuff like that and so I thought oh maybe I should do something fancy like creme brulee and put it in little glass mason jars so people could take it home um, but I was blow torching them to order and um, the thing about that is the hard caramel topping only stays hard for a couple of hours and I noticed a lot of people saying oh I would love to take a couple for a party this weekend, et cetera, or I'm going to eat it for dinner tomorrow night. And I was like, well, it's going to be more like flan. So yeah. I kind of started brainstorming this idea of how to um, keep the hard caramel topping hard um, and without having to ask people to buy or use a blowtorch at home. So, because a lot of people were like, oh, well, I know, you know, I never have creme brulee unless I'm in a restaurant because I don't want to make it at home. It's too fussy and, um, and I'm scared to use a blowtorch or I don't want to buy one. And so I created this um, hard caramel disc. It's like really thin kind of wafer and it's just caramelized sugar and it's packaged separately from the custard. So it's kind of um, deconstructed. So when people take it home, they kind of assemble it themselves and all they have to do is put it on top and then it's ready to eat. They just crack it with their spoon. So I'd heard about this class um, from a friend of mine that I used to cook with here in Portland. He said, you should move back and take this class. And um, I trusted him and I did. And I'm about six months in now and I'm exclusively in all of the new seasons markets. And Erin just provided me with an awesome segue. I have to say that, you know, of course, learning about food safety and food science is incredibly important for a product that is going to be used for human consumption. And learning how to take the product into the marketplace and how to build a business is important. But none of that would be complete without our partnership with New Seasons. And we do have a representative here tonight from New Seasons <laughs> who's going to be up front a little bit later to tell you a little bit about some special programs that New Seasons has to support food entrepreneurs. Thank you very much for your commitment. So we'll start now with a series of questions and um, one of the things that I'm interested in knowing about is after taking the program, what was your journey and timeline like? You had this preconceived idea, I believe many of you did coming into the program about what you wanted to do. Is that what happened for you and who did you sell to first? So um, let's start back with Erin and we'll go the opposite direction. So. So, Erin, you're most recent in the program, yes? Yes. Okay. I'm a baby. I took the class. It's it's crazy to think it's almost a year ago that I signed up for the class. It started last March, and um, so I was in the spring term of the 12-week course. And at the end, I got a meeting with New Seasons, and um, they kind of said, "Whenever you're ready, let me know." And I kind of strategically, and I, and I like to think it was my plan, but it might have been more their plan too, but I thought I didn't really want to launch until the fall because I wanted to kind of get the kinks worked out for the holiday season, but I did think it would be a good holiday product. And I didn't really think like July or August was a good month to launch Creme Brulee. Um, and so I said, okay, a couple months, and they said, we'll get in touch when you're ready. And so I did, and... Um, that was, I think that was June or July, I had the meeting with them, and then um, I launched September 28th was my first delivery, so, yeah. 
That's my timeline. And Josh, for your company, because you're kind of in the middle between Rebecca and Aaron, who did you sell to first and who also are you selling to today? So, um, <clears throat> excuse me, in similar fashion, we started with New Seasons and and that was as a direct result of the connection through the, the course. And we, um, we started small, as, as I guess all startups probably do, but it took us four months to get, uh, we started with a, a domestic kitchen, which you have the, uh, the ODA come in and, and license your personal kitchen. And after going through one order for new seasons with my, my own small oven, I realized this is never going to work. And so I got into a commercial kitchen shortly after that. Um, but uh, so we were in the commercial kitchen for about three years and really got to max capacity because we were we were um, doing the mom and pop uh, kind of thing, you know, grandparents, siblings, everybody coming in to work on this endeavor and all the while working toward a co-packer, which was something that I was introduced to through the classes. Uh, it was a new idea I'd never thought about. And so um, I knew early on that a co-packer was where our business needed to go. And so over the last three years, it was a matter of taking really good care of New Seasons. They'd taken really good care of us. And so we sold only to New Seasons for three years while um, while we're working toward getting the co-packer. And so we, we this last fall, uh, just got into a co-packer. Now we have production uh, capabilities beyond what mom and pop were able to do. And so now we're just starting to grow our sales. Um, this last week I met with Market of Choice and they've agreed to bring us on, which is really exciting. Mm -hmm. um, and then I've done a few other just, you know, internet orders and um, Lamb's Thriftway and like us we go. So, so we're just budding into the sales and marketing portion of our, our life, life uh, the, the lifespan. So. And Rebecca, you've always been very clear about the kind of business that you wanted to create. Yes. Um, I, you know, when I went through the class, New Seasons assessed our products, and at the time it was in an eight-ounce deli tub. And they, Lisa Sedler said that she thought the product should, was warranted a nicer container. So that then shifted the whole concept of a simple deli tub to a more expensive, but uh, you know, a much longer lasting shelf life, all of that was actually, it worked out really well for me. But the first, our first customer was Foodfront, which is very interesting. We're no longer in Foodfront, and we, it took a long time to get into new seasons. So it was just, you know, I'm not quite sure why, but we, we, they liked our product, but it just wasn't for whatever reason. We got into Food Front and we got into Whole Foods and then we just kind of recently got into New Seasons. And uh, then from there we got into Market of Choice and we're up in Seattle and down in Eugene and like Thriftway. So slowly over time it's, it's kind of taken hold. But my concept from the very beginning is that I did not have a lot of marketing dollars and it was more important for me to go deep and local because you know, people were telling me that they were getting in in California and in regional areas, and I just kept on thinking, how are they supporting their products? And there are very few products that you could just show up on the shelf and people are gonna grab for them. Especially at the higher end, I think it's so critical that you have the support with marketing and people on the ground presenting your products, whether it be in-store demos, or we still are heavily into the local farmer's markets and then we drive people to the markets from the farmers markets. So it sounds like all of you have had some interesting and important lessons learned. Yes. So knowing what you know today and how you envisioned entering to the marketplace, what are some of your top five lessons learned that you'd like to pass on to this group of, of things that you think are really important as you're just starting out on this journey? A lot. Okay, yeah. all right. Well, we can go with three, Rebecca. Okay, each of you can well, take one. Josh that? said, even though you said like it was a mom and pop, I really feel like I wish that I had had either five family members, five friends that were so equally committed to the development and growth of our product line that it wasn't just me running around <laughs> doing a million things. Uh, if you have like a little army or a little crew, you know, you're e equally vested. You do that many more demos, you could do that many more farmers markets, and it will grow exponentially. If you can partner with the right people, again, it's the right people, because it could be a disaster if it's not the right people, 
But if you have a <coughs> core of people that you work well with, that you might even bring different strengths to the table, I think that would be critical. I think that's been my hardest thing, that then finding, you know, either I have to hire people because they're not part of the core development group, but I think if you, if people can get together and form a little coalition and build a business from that, because it's the building of the business that's the hardest part for me. Thank you for those words of wisdom. And Josh, you had a coalition. Yeah. Were, there, were there lessons learned from your coalition? I, you know, I think that it was, um, I learned how faithful family can be <laughs> and, and how, um, I mean, because it, it seemed like every time I would, I would think we were about to transition or hit a milestone and then, you know, have, move forward with the co-packer, that was the big thing for us is, is, um, is actually when I first called the co-packers after I'd been in business for a year and I called them up thinking that we could get going in an, a week or two <laughs> and come to find out there's a lot of R&D and there's changes in packaging and then there's different ingredient sourcing there's so much involved that it was actually a very lengthy process and so uh, each time I would tell my family oh by Christmas we, we're gonna be done baking or oh by spring break <laughs> or oh by summer and uh, so I just am um, incredibly indebted to their belief in the company and their belief in me and um, and the product and so um, yeah to what you're saying uh, if, if they hadn't been available I would have I would have had to change the, the direction of the company it would have required um, hiring people I couldn't there's no way I could have done it on my own so which, which actually is um, makes me think of one of the lessons that I've learned early on is uh, as an entrepreneur, I'm very inspiration driven, I'm very people driven, I'm not as numbers driven, and uh, I'm not an accountant, I've never <laughs> wanted to be one. Um, but looking back, there were a couple of points where um, had I given more attention to uh, margins, cost of goods, different things, uh, maybe I would have been able to hire a few people to help out or relieve the load uh, had I worked those in early on. And so what, I, what we ended up realizing is that we'd initially underpriced our our product just because we really didn't know and then as we grew and figured out what the business demanded it forced us it was very scary it forced us to raise our price and then we thought what's going to happen and, and you know the the customers responded well and and you know and now we're in a good spot so looking back you know if you can do that due diligence on the on the financial side early and give yourself the margins which when you're small it, they seem very large but as you grow and you bring in more partners they're very necessary so excellent input and Aaron how about you gosh I mean there's a lot um, definitely agree with um, having a support group I look back on just the last six months and like both of you guys, have, I mean, I don't know what I would have done if I if I didn't know a single person here in Portland or if I didn't have any family members, I probably wouldn't still be afloat right now. You know, there's those late nights or the grandma that passes away and you have to go to New York and it's like, who do you call on? And um, it's really something that you have to give some serious thought to. And um, I think it was maybe you, Jill, or Pam Kramer, one of my advisors from the class and I had contacted them a couple months ago talking about bringing on some partners and giving them a percentage of the business and they were you know kind of leery about numbers and percentages but one of them did say um, going into business alone is scary and I was like gosh you are so right and even just that four percent or whatever you're willing to give away or whatever you're willing to do to feel like you have somebody to lean on it was worth it for me um, and then the other thing that just really stands out in terms of like words of wisdom is like cost of goods. I mean, what it all really boils down to is like we're all in business to make money. And if you're not, well, you're lucky, but most of us, you know, <laughs> that's why we're doing it. And, um, and I just like, you hear it a lot and it's like, you can't say it enough, like make sure you have those numbers you know, down before you get started because you would just hate to think all of that time and effort and energy and money and then to realize that it's not going to work or you're not going to make any money or you're actually losing money. I mean, how tragic would that be? So, so cost of goods and, you know, support. Um, if you need, like for me, I'm really, um, I'm a horrible bookkeeper. I've never had any interest in it. I hate math. I hate all that stuff. 
and um, I knew from the beginning I didn't want to do it and if you don't want to do it find someone to do it for you because you can't let stuff like that slip through the cracks so mm -hmm. yeah get help <laughs> so I know that each of you um, coming through the program were encouraged by your business advisor at the SBDC to choose your best product to take through the program or best product or two but many of you now have new products, perhaps, that you've brought into the marketplace. How did you know when it was time to innovate? What kinds of things did you look at in the marketplace to know that it was time to bring a new product in for those of you who have? And Rebecca, I'll start with you because I know you have. Can you talk about your innovation timeline a little bit? Well, we started off with three sauces and then by developing recipes with each of these products, they, we created two more products because people wanted to have that direct product. They, I'd be talking about making a salad dressing with the Thai by just adding some seasoned rice vinegar, and they said, well, I just want to buy the dressing. And then, and then we developed recipes with this where you add this to peanut butter and water and you get a great peanut sauce. So then people, and I haven't developed a peanut sauce yet, and I think it's very costly to develop new product in terms of just scaling it up, containers, doing all the testing. So, but a lot of times with these, developing recipes then develop new product. You know, because I started off with four products. I started off with the three sauces, and then this is an organic fig and olive tapenade. And then these develop these over time. So it, it does take on a life of its own, and somehow things that you never thought you would be developing suddenly seem at the forefront of your plans. And it's hard to really predict. You, you know, that's the one thing about being in the farmer's market doing in-store demos. You really get a sense of what the people want. Mm -hmm. And I think that's critical, that being a small <coughs> entrepreneur, uh, you want to be in touch with who, you're, who, who your market is. And I think going, you know, people want to get to that level where they don't have to do the farmer's market. They don't have to do the um, in-house demos. But I think there's a lot of information that you could garner, especially in the early years. So Josh, you were pretty clear about what you were bringing into the marketplace. Yeah. What's your opinion about that today, and what are you thinking about in terms of innovation, <coughs> and yeah. where you see yourself going? Uh, so, so I've got the one the one chocolate chip cookie uh, to market, and I've I've developed three other formulas or recipes uh, with the innovation center, and those are just on the back burner waiting. And um, I got some really good advice once to go deep with a product before you go wide, um, because it was a couple years ago. In fact, I was meeting with Tammy and I wanted to just bring a ton to market and I hadn't really gone very far yet with the one cookie and so so for me what I'm doing is I'm continuing to work the plan I've got a few more elements uh, that I, I want to explore and expand into uh, before then bringing in uh, that second flavor um, and, and similar to what you're saying there is a lot of cost involved in uh, the new packaging and buying that in bulk and then uh, the R&D and different things so so it, it's not as easy as just you know, flipping a switch and saying, oh, let's bring on another cookie. It, it has to be very calculated. And so what kind of indications will you look for? I recognize I'm asking you questions that weren't given to you in advance, and you're doing great at fielding yeah. them. But what kind of marketplace indicators are you going to be looking for to know it's time to bring a new product in? You know, I, I don't know yet. I don't know. Um, I, I think I've been focusing more internally on what the business can handle. And um, so I, I think with the question actually brings a, a good, um, it's a good question for me to explore because I've been focusing more on uh, what, what makes sense for the business in terms of where we need to get to before releasing it. I hadn't even been thinking about what's the market demanding and maybe that'll change my timeline. So, okay, good well, question. For that. Yeah. So, Aaron, I'm really fascinated with uh, the journey that you took in terms of how you started with the creme brulee packaging idea yes. and how you landed on what I think is a truly innovative packaging design. Could, would you mind telling us a little bit about that journey? Sure, yeah. And I always I do reflect on our meeting. I'm sure you remember I had this jar that I had found, and it's it's a Weck brand. I don't know if anybody's familiar with it. They're these high-end, um, like, canning jars from Germany, and they're gorgeous, and I was obsessed with them, and I thought, I have to have this jar for the creme brulee, and they were so expensive. 
and I was literally to the point of I had this jar and I was like carrying around with my purse every day because I didn't want to let go of it and I and I kept showing it to everybody and being like oh what do you think you know but it's so expensive I don't know if I can afford it and I knew the business could not afford it but I still just couldn't let go and um, I had a meeting with Tammy and it was like actually kind of a breakthrough where she kind of like took the jar and was like, you're, you're gonna have to let go of the jar <laughs> and you're gonna have to move on because the business is never gonna like succeed with this cost of goods. And like in that moment I thought, okay, I have to listen to you. And so I, I got rid of the jar and I you know started on a new journey of trying to find the right, right glass jar. and. Um, and I did settle on a little four ounce um, mason jar. It's unquilted, it's just plain, and it was it was really hard to find, and um, I was so happy when I found it, and I thought, oh, this is the perfect thing. And then um, on another aspect, I, I just, I have really complicated packaging for my product. It's really tedious because of the caramel disc. Um, it needs to be, kept from oxygen and moisture and it's also extremely fragile so it breaks really easy and I thought well how the heck am I going to seal this thing up without breaking it and um, include it in the packaging without it getting broken during distributing and stacking and etc. It's just a lot of months of uh, brainstorming and bouncing ideas off of a lot of friends. I'm fortunate to have a lot of pastry chef friends and foodie friends and chef friends and um, a lot of trial and error. And um, I was just kind of thinking too big, thinking too complicated. I was going to these packaging companies and talking about like vacuum sealing and all sorts of crazy expensive um, packaging. And then I just, I don't know, one day I was playing around with it at home and I thought, you know, just think about it, just think about it. And I, and I thought, well, gosh, I mean, the whole thing about a canning jar, a mason jar, is that they're meant to seal. And so I realized that the lid, if you crank it hard enough on top, it, it does create a seal. And so what I did was I found this amazing paper made by Reynolds, and it's plastic coated on one side and parchment on the other. And it's meant for freezer paper, butcher paper, stuff like that, but it has the moisture barrier. And so I took two pieces of those and I sandwiched the crispy disc in between and then clamped the lid on and screwed it tight and it keeps the seal. So it was as simple as that. Um, and so I almost in a way created the packaging myself. I made my own ring molds because they need to be a perfect size for the crispy disc to fit right inside the jar. Um, so I ended up making my own ring molds out of silk pats and um, I don't know, the rest was history, I guess. Thanks but it for was, yeah, that. it was, it was, a, it was uh, challenging to say the least. Yeah. And I, I mean, I really thought there was no answer and I was gonna have to give up and that this product wasn't gonna work. Um, but I just kept chipping away at it and Tammy really like helped me, like I said, break through, break through the jar scenario, so. And so Erin is a creative food entrepreneur. Um, what do you envision as your next endeavor? Do you oh have gosh. something on the next horizon that you want to share with us? Uh, no, not particularly. I mean, for the creme brulees, um, it's just like kind of what you said. I think I'm going to go really deep into the product before I go wide. Um, I'm not really interested in anything else at the moment. They are consuming most of my life, and um, and I'm still, you know, always working on cost of goods and production and everything else. Um, so yeah, that for now is just going to be, you know, it's going to be like a long, slow journey. But I'm I'm definitely like ready for it. And then I I don't know I have some other side projects like cooking projects and stuff like that. But no, no other. Um, food products for the market. So I have one last question and I want to be respectful of the audience as well and, and uh, be able to turn it over to them because I'm sure that you all have really great questions. So you've um, followed your dream. You all had a passion to bring your unique products to the marketplace. Um, any regrets about doing that? If you knew then what you know now, what would you say to your former self about this journey that you've been on? knowing what you know now. I'm glad I didn't know what I knew now. <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes, you know, ignorance is bliss, I guess. I don't know. It's, I mean, it's scary. The numbers are scary. I just, we've really got to crunch those numbers and make sure it's worth it. But it is. 
I think, Josh, when you equated having that fourth child, <laughs> it's like having a child that you don't even know what you're getting into. And it's like, you know, at the baby stage, you're all excited and it's all cute. And then it's like you hit those teenage years and it's like, oh my gosh, what am I doing? It's very much like having a child because you just cannot know in that deep knowing way of what it all entails. So I think that, you know, that uh, comparing it to having a child is really, really how I see yeah. it. Yeah. And I think for me, the, the dream's still alive. Uh, you know, we're, we're still uh, in, in the process of writing the story. And I think only, you know, at some future point will I be able to look back and say, you know, as hindsight is always twenty twenty, was was that good, a good move or not? Um, I think that, that um, the, the, I don't know, just all the things we choose to do, especially the challenging things, they grow us and they mold us and they make us who we are. And, and, uh, and so in those regards, there's, it's absolutely no regrets. Um, but it, it's too early to know. It's, you know I think, think the dream of, of most food entrepreneurs is to um, you know, maybe either one day just hand it off to the next generation or to, to sell or to, to do something that's like that final milestone. And you know, we're still so, it's still so early, the story's being written. Mm -hmm. so. Great perspective. So I'd like to hear from the foodies in the audience. You have questions for our panelists? Yes, in the back. Yeah, actually, two questions. One's a two-parter. Uh, is there such a thing as a copyright on a recipe, and if someone claims that the recipe was copied, how do you deal with that? There isn't one. Wow. You can change a grain of salt. Mm -hmm. it's, okay. Yeah. You can't own a recipe. Question, yeah, so the question was, is there such a thing as a copyright on a recipe? And if there is, what do you do? I think I understood. What do you do if someone, um, you know, uses your recipe? How do you protect your recipe? I believe that's the question. And Rebecca said. There is. A, but you know what? You can protect your process. Like That's what I was going to say. Yes. Because I've looked in the patents and stuff, and they're not <laughs> cheap. But. Um, Recipes, not so much, but the process is really what's um, what you can do something about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but a recipe is very like like you said, a grain of salt, a gram of anything, and you can say that it's a different recipe. Yeah. So it's it's really hard. I don't really even know if anybody's ever patented a recipe or copyrighted one. How do you acquire a commercial kitchen? Uh, is there a list on so the question in the back is, how do you acquire a commercial kitchen? Acquire, you mean develop your own or well, find out say, about say it? Say your housing didn't allow you to do it at home and you needed to get to rent a kitchen. Where's Don't you have a list? I mean, so, yes, yeah. yeah, so uh, the Getting Recipe to Market program does have uh, a list of commercial kitchens. Um, how did you find the commercial kitchens that you were using? Josh, for example. Uh, so because I have a gluten-free product, of course, it has to be dedicated. Mm -hmm. And so I went to the Gluten Intolerant Group um, Food Expo, and I, you know, of course, was going and trying products and just introduced myself to all the different vendors, said, hey, I'm, I'm new to the market, I'm looking for a place, you know, where do you bake? And uh, it's just through through that sort of thing, I, I found the, the folks that I ended up partnering with. So. And Erin, are you um, producing in your home commercial kitchen right now? How is your production? Um, I I do work out of a commercial kitchen in Southeast. I guess I got kind of lucky. It's like a restaurant that does all their production at a kitchen, and then they truck it over to their restaurant every day. And um, it was like their friends of friends, and there's a prep crew in there, eight to four every day, and then the nights are free, so I rent from them at night. But I did start at um, Kitchen Crew, mm -hmm. who are amazing, and I have only good things to say about them. They're probably the best well-known commissary in town, I would think. They're not gluten-free, which is hard to find, um, but they, um, they're they awesome, and it's always a good place to start, even just to like get your feet wet and you know, kind of get comfortable in the environment of a shared kitchen. Um, they're really accommodating and they want to help you in any way that they can. And it's a beautiful big facility downtown. And they've got everything that you could need and more. So. Okay, question down here. Um, I was just wondering, um, I imagine that some food entrepreneurs, a small percentage might be independently wealthy, but probably most are not. And we have other jobs. And so if you could just 
speak a couple words about how do you balance that, you know, I have to work my nine to five job, oh, and then there's this business I'm trying to start. Mm -hmm. On that, just terms of balancing, how did you do it? Uh, I fortunately saved up a big chunk of change from when I ran my food cart in California the summer before I decided to take the class and I um, used all of that to start the business and support myself and it's all it's pretty much all gone now so I'm like <laughs> trying to get into a farmers market here this um, this spring which is gonna be like just in the nick of time but I always think back the creme relays are so time-consuming for me and um, I if I was working a regular job, even a part-time job, I don't know if I would still be afloat with the creme brulees because I think at some point I would have just thrown in the towel and been like, I can't do it, it's too much. Everyone's different depending on your volume, the type of product you have, you know. Um, you can really only do the best you can to guesstimate how many hours a week it's gonna take from your life, but mine took a lot and it still does. So I, I was fortunate in that, that manner. Um, but I, I mean, a lot of people do both and I don't know how they do it, so. Nights and weekends yeah. is how you do it. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, so I do work full time as I'm growing the business and which is really why a lot of the family support came in and also why for my business, it became important to uh, partner with other industry experts with distributors and co-packers and things so that I could be the businessman rather than the baker. Um, but uh, but I think back to the, it, what allows anyone to do anything difficult is when you have a, a, a vision or a strong end goal in mind. And so the minutia of, oh my gosh, I'm up late labeling bags for hours into the, <sighs> you know, past midnight regularly, th those sort of things, um, giving up your weekends, it, it's all worth it when you can conceptualize an end goal. So, um, you know, that you know, I, I think about the folks who go back to school, you know, you're working full time, you're doing night school, different things like that. You can see what is While to come. It. So yeah. it's a similar kind of thing. This is my school. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's a good one. That's an interesting perspective. It is, it's good, yeah. It's a good one. And Rebecca, for you, how, how is that? I have an incredibly supportive husband. <laughs> just, I'm really, really lucky. He has been the biggest champion of when I've been thinking, what am I doing? He's always been there financially and always. You know, I just knock on wood. And I've also used most of my retirement from Delta. So, and that's all gone. So, I mean, it, it takes a lot. It does take a lot of backing. It takes twice as much as you think it's going yeah. to. Yes, question here. Um, when you're talking about the, the bottom line of what your ingredients cost, and you you all mentioned that you have to watch that the margin there, I'm I'm not quite sure of the verbiage, but how do you you come up with a number of what it costs you to prepare that? Mm -hmm. Then you have I have no insight as to what its packaging will cost. So where's the line there? How do you figure, is that part of your initial cost processes? And Every single bit is part of the bottom line. Yeah. And yeah. some of the stuff you don't even calculate yeah. in. It's like, like you like, pay yeah. yourself, you know, yeah. running around. Yeah. That's why the GYRM class is very yeah. handy. <laughs> did that help a lot? They very did. Much There's, so. Yeah, David Hill, who's part of the class, and everyone else. Um, that is a counselor and stuff in the class, but yeah, they will go over all of that and they will help you down to every last fraction of what you need to calculate and stuff that I would have never known about. Um, you know, for example, when you do, when you run your numbers and do your costs, you calculate in um, a margin for distribution because at some point you're gonna wanna stop distributing yourself Either you're not going to be able to because the company has grown too big or you're just too darn burnt out on it. But either way, that margin needs to be there. So when you do go to a distributor and they start taking 40% or whatever, you aren't all of a sudden losing money on your product. You know, all sorts of stuff like that. <coughs> they can help you with everything. Yeah. I have a question here in the front. Do you have a Coke packer? Yes, I started with a Coke packer right away. Oh, right away. Yeah. So then maybe for... For Josh, you transitioned from one to the other. Did you find that you also mentioned you had a price increase? How was how your prices, in your experience alone, how was your price, how did it compare from doing it yourself to using a co-packer? 
Yeah, so so we came into the market. Our cookies cost four ninety nine a bag, and they currently cost six ninety nine a bag. So we had to increase it two dollars. Yeah, well, and, and the distributor, so and and the different packaging that went along with it. So it was, it was kind of all all of the above. Um, but it um, the reason that four ninety nine worked is because my family and I were all just living on love, yeah. and, uh, and it was you know which was great because it built the foundation and um, and it got us to where we are now. But but the business did demand that, and and that was one of the one of the conversations I had to have with my advisor Pam at the time was. You know, this is scary. What if everybody runs away and never buys another cookie because I have to charge more? And it's you know, th those are the kind of challenges that you face as an entrepreneur. But you know, it all worked out. Josh, you've had you've had several advisors at the mm -hmm. Small Business Development Center. How long have you been working with advisors? Uh, th probably three years, and uh, the times that I've been most consistent uh, have been the most productive, as you might imagine. Um, well, what I found is is that uh, it's very easy to sort of pull away into your own world of entrepreneurship, and you're just you know put your head down and you're doing your your stuff. Um, motivation ebbs and flows. But when I would regularly meet with an advisor, even if it just seemed like a check-in, it was always you know you're always Always just mo one month away from reconnecting, getting grounded, having your sights set on what's next. Um, you know, both short term and long term. So it's, it's very valuable. Rebecca, how was that experience for you? It's, it's been a long time since yes. you've been in the program, but you also worked with an advisor for a while. Yes, and I, you know, I'm just shaking my head with, with what Josh said. It's just having that go-to group of people that understands where you're at and could advise you in terms of, you know, are you, in their opinion, heading in the right direction, or do you need to rethink this? And it could be a group of fellow classmates in, in the program that, you know, you could just kind of brainstorm with them. But I think it's really important not to just isolate yourself, to really somehow stay tied in. Not, you know, to the food world, entrepreneur world is great, but last night I went to an OEN meeting and that was really good too it's a Oregon entrepreneurial network mm -hmm. and they had a really great speaker and it was he had a company called Vacasa which is a vacation home rental and he <coughs> talked about how he built his business you know and it, it's very applicable to anything but it kind of keeps keeps you motivated you know because there is an entrepreneurial spirit that either when you have it it's kind of like a bug how many of you have this bug out there raise your hand <laughs> Yeah, good to see you all. There was a question back, I think there was one back here and then we'll come back up here to you. Yeah, I guess my, my question is uh, to Josh and I guess Rebecca, you can chime in too. When you're using a co-packer, can you give me a rough idea from the, the, start, the time you actually got to sign a contract and you, they, they take it over until the time the product hits the shelf? Uh, it was it wasn't as clear cut for for my experience. It actually took us um, almost two years of you know a lot of just back and forth communication. It's actually been interesting to see the different people who have come and gone on their end, uh, just because as businesses you know people people leave and so. Um, so yeah, for me it was about two years because because I started the conversation with them, but then I needed to go over here and talk to my my primary packaging company, and then I needed to come talk to the 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 box company, and then I needed to talk to a designer, and there's all these pieces that lead to then moving forward with the co-packer. So in addition to them working on your product and getting your your cookie just right. So um, my experience with my co-packer, I was incredibly lucky to have found my co-packer and what I, my advice though is it's such a personal relationship. You need to find someone who really understands you and understands, I guess, what you're bringing to the marketplace because not all co-packers are the same. And I'd gone to interview a number of co-packers and some of them wanted to change all my uh, recipes. They wanted to streamline it for them and I thought, well, then it's not my product. And I found, I happened to find a co-packer who uh, listened really well to my product. And at the time, I think I only had this. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but he, went, when he gave me his <coughs> cost estimate to scale everything up, it was way outside my budget. So I talked to him, I said, you know, if I do all this cost analysis and find out this and that, and I come back to you with all that information, will you co-pack for me? And he said, sure. So, I mean, six months later, I called him up, and 
we're ready to go. It was a re it's been always a really good fit for me, but it's very individual. And how many years have you been with your co-packer? From 2007. Wow, yeah. mm -hmm. amazing. Who is your Chef George. Yeah, I mean, and, and but I've I've introduced people that it hasn't worked as well for them. Mm -hmm. So it's a very special relationship, <coughs> and for me, it you know it's just worked out really well. There was a question here. I'm sorry, there was a question here in the middle on the third well, row. I was going to ask you about co-packers, you know, and how you um, did that process, and did you end up going to two or three different co-packers? I'd go to as many as you can. But I meant, oh. did you sign contracts oh. with them and then move on? So you just interviewed, what were the criteria you used that you think really well, differentiated I, them? <laughs> I, mean, I really trust my intuition for one, but you do have to have a, a framework for, you know, will they, will they for one, do what, are they capable of doing whatever your product is? You know, because like if there's things like gluten issues, you have to be more specific. Some, there's special co-packers that just deal with certain types of products. Um, I would interview as many as you can and um, go see the facility, um, I don't know. Did you have a like a list of questions, specific questions? I mean, it's been so long yeah, for me. I, I didn't use them. I, yeah, I, it's, like, I, I get, it's the intuition. I think, yeah. like you're saying, I mean, I got a good feel for the people. I went to the facility mm -hmm. um, because I was gluten free. I was fairly fairly limited uh, based on where the certified co-packers were, and you know, so it. I didn't have the, as much of a chance to shop around, but thankfully, the one that I'm with is fantastic. It's, yeah. Yeah. One last question: What percentage of your um, cost of goods sold and your gross, your margins are tied in with the co-pack. About what percentage of your mine's about twenty percent. Twenty percent. It's pretty bad. Yeah, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't know. Only because they also source the ingredients, and so, so they're rather than a, a, yes. being a percentage, yeah. they're just the base cost. Well, that's what, and they, then I build that's everything. That's the percentage off of that. that they base it on for me. Okay, the sourced ingredients. Yeah. They'll take twenty percent above that. <clears throat> oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Did that answer your question over here? Um, yes. I, well, my question was, I was wondering who your co-packer was, but also, do they also distribute? Um, so the co-packer I use is, they're called Betty Lou's, and they don't distribute. So I, yeah, I've got a, a logistics company called J&D Refrigerated Services, and they, so they do the trucking, and they store our product in a freezer out in Clackamas, and then I've got a distributor who comes and picks up the product from the warehouse, and then they do the distribution, so. Question, yes. So as a consumer, we hear the phrase farm to table, uh, and it draws us to restaurants. Is there a movement for small food processors like yourselves to distribute directly to restaurants? And if so, what is that movement like and has it inspired any thoughts with regards to innovating your products? That's called food service. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'll tell you, retail is the hardest way to make a living. If in fact you can get your products into some sort of level of food service, whether it be new seasons, you know, their deli or a restaurant, it's, it's something that would really be beneficial to most businesses. You don't have to resell it, you don't have to do the demos because your audience is that, whether it be Bon Appetit or a big corporate restaurant. Okay. Yeah. There's a question in back here. So, uh, the difficulty of making a living is that's a good segue. Uh, so, I have an idea, it's sort of a complicated recipe, it's like a stew with vegetables and that sort of thing. And um, I find it very easy to talk myself out of even pursuing it by saying, well, you know, what's the market for that? How big could that get? How big does that even have to get before it takes the place of my current income, much less goes bigger and better? So can you talk about that a bit? And that's a really big question, but that's the thing that always lets me so the question that you asked is actually a really great segue uh, to my next presenter, which is Jill Beeman, to talk about the Getting a Recipe to Market program, because the question that you asked is, 
if I heard you right, is um, how do I know if my recipe has viability in the marketplace? And when is my product not the product that I'm imagining? And what are the steps and the processes to get it there? And, and, and what, do, what if I don't know what I don't know? How will I know that, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that tends to be the question of the day. So I'm going to introduce Jill Beeman, who is the co-founder of Getting Your Recipe to Market. We met in 2006, and she rejoined the program in 2011 after starting a family and coming back. So Jill, why don't you come up? And then we're going to be here afterwards for a lot of other questions to be answered. Um, but we're going to turn it over to Jill at okay. this time. Hi, welcome. Um, so that is a really big question that we tackle in the class. Um, and we have a, a group of four of us advisors in the program. And, and Tammy would kind of be a fifth. She's kind of um, a, a go-to person for us, too. Um, but we do. We do, you know, you, in the class you would be doing break-even analysis. How many units am I going to have to sell just to cover the costs of my business per month. So that's something you definitely would be, we'd be doing some analysis of. Um, and that is something we go over, but we ha all of us advisors have a different kind of specialty. So myself as an advisor, I find I'm helping people out more, more with like, what are the individual steps to get like this recipe to a prototype, commercial ready prototype to talk with Chris at New Seasons. Um, Uri, Kushner is another advisor who was with the program since the beginning. He's the guy that we say kind of will poke holes in your plan. So you're like, I want to make this and I want to sell it at this store or I want to take it this, to this food service venue. And he's like, why do you think that's going to work? Um, what about X, Y, and Z? Have you thought about um, corporate gifting, online sales? He's kind of the guy that I send clients to. If I'm like, I don't know if they've thought this all the way through, and he's really the kind of the big idea guy or the idea crushing guy. Um, but it's good you need to hear from those people. And then David Hill, he's really kind of our the cost of goods guy. He will look at your uh, all your process to make your product, the labor, all the ingredients and packaging, and then help you with the stales, the steps to scale that up and what that will look like. So, um, and then another important person on our team is Dr. Wells, um, and he is a quality assurance director for all of Safeway down in Pleasanton, and he used to be the superintendent of the Food Innovation Center when I worked there years ago. Um, and so he is still a member of our team, and he comes up during the third or fourth week for a whole course. And he also is um, available via phone each week to consult with you on any of your um, food science and packaging questions. So we really feel the whole team can help you with that, some of those big questions. Um, and that kind of segues, I wanted to just kind of give you an overview of what our program looks like because as you can tell it's a really overwhelming endeavor to go into this food business and and in this course we do it really quick you know you have your recipe you're just making it home and you're buying your ingredients at the grocery store to we're sourcing wholesale ingredients at the end you're working with packaging people you've got a prototype package and label and you're meeting with buyers it's a really really quick marathon um, and it can be overwhelming but hopefully I always say to people who are thinking of taking the class, um, we're hopefully, we will be saving you a lot of time and money um, because we bring in those 14 weeks all the people that you'll need to deal with to get that product to market. So instead of you going out there on your own, you're bringing, we're bringing them all together for you to talk to and you have those contacts as well as the people in your cohort. Um, and, and as you guys have mentioned earlier, you're all in the class going through the same process and you're often like hey has anybody found a label maker like this or has anybody found um, uh, containers at this price or has anybody found a certain ingredient what where what prices are you getting and you're sharing information um, so the getting your recipe to market program is a partnership with Food Innovation Center, which is part of OSU, and New Seasons Market. And we've been partners since the beginning. And we definitely help each other, and they, we bring everybody in together for um, various classes and topics. 
So this is a pathway to commercialization, and Dr. Wells created this for the program. And um, when you, if you pick up a handout, you can look at it more in depth. But it's basically what we see as the timeline for your during the course from the first week you're working on your market survey, and that's when I give you your first assignment, and it's to go to the grocery store with your camera phone and you're taking pictures of similar products. You're taking pictures of the ingredients, what the package looks like, and what the cost is, and what the ounce amount is. And you're putting that all together and you're really finding out what are consumers willing to pay for your product? What are they paying for those similar products on the market? So you go from there to, then we go into the second week of food science. We really wanna make sure you're making a safe product and there are regulations and uh, licenses that you need to get. So we bring in Sarah Massoni from the Food Innovation Center, and we bring in Will Fargo from the Oregon Department of Agriculture, and they talk to you about your specific products and what you <coughs> need, what the steps are. Because if you go to the ODA website, it's kind of a maze to get through, so we bring them to you. And then he's awesome. Once you have his contact, you can email back and forth all your specific questions. So we go into the food science, and then we go into packaging and sourcing ingredients and and on until you get your prototype. And throughout this, we're con constantly bringing back cost of goods sold, cost of goods sold. And I say that because it's the one thing that I've noticed clients in the program, they just don't want to look at. Because I think in the back of their head, they're like, oh my god, this is so expensive. But we force you to. You have to look at it. And if it's too expensive, we need to find another ingre uh, ingredient supplier. We need to get find you know buy in larger amounts to get the, the cost down. On the top? Uh, those, those are weeks. So it's 12 weeks, of course. And then the 13th week is evaluations with new seasons, and the 14th week is a trade show. Which is really fun. Yeah. Yeah. So the 13th week, we'll set up a half hour appointment at New Seasons headquarters with three of their buyers. And we'll match them up to their category buyers based on what your product is. And it's really you just sit down with them, they sample your product, you show them what your prototype looks like. This is what I think my packaging will look like and my label will look like, and you'll get the feedback. So we don't want you to have your final because you really want to hear from them. They know their customers and they know what will work. You could come with a tall bottle and they're like, that won't fit on our shelves. This is how much room we have on our shelves. So you really want to talk to them before you sink a chunk of change in on your packaging. Yeah? So We recommend you pick your your best one or two. It depends, are they similar products or if it's just a, oh yeah, so if you have one or two flavors, I would say bring them Focus during the class on one of them. And then the New Seasons buyers are like, well do you, do you have any other ones you're in the, in the pipeline that you're thinking of? And you, you would present your other flavors and get feedback from them because they'd be like, oh, you're focusing on this savory one. This sweet one is actually what we think you should start with. But throughout the class, you know, if you just focus on one, like what does it take to produce this one, then it'll keep you more focused. Yeah. How often do you present the class? So how, many, how, often? how often do you present the class? So this 14 week course is provided or is put on twice a year in the spring and the fall. Okay, so this, this next one starts on March 3rd and goes through um, early June, and then the, um, in this fall it'll start early to mid-September. Yeah. There's a, is this, are you coordinating with uh, the Oregon University? They have Food Innovation Center. I'm not from Portland, mm -hmm. so are, are you the same? This is PCC. Correct? Yeah, so this course, I used to work at the OSU Food Innovation Center, which is here in Portland, yes. on Northwest NATO. And this program was started with them and with the PCC Small Business Development Center. So we're partners with them as far as we, we help promote each other's programs and services. And um, they host our trade show at the end. Sarah, who's their product developer, comes in and speaks in our course. So this is separate, though, in terms of the training, this, all of this. Yeah, this program is put on by the Small Business Development Center through PCC. Yes. Oh, sorry. 
Okay. Um, so I just wanted to um, show you guys who we bring in. So um, we f I finalized who our speakers are. We sometimes change up some things each each time we put the program on, but um, we bring in the Specialty Food Association is kind of an unofficial partner of ours. We support each other and go to each other's events. So Ron Tanner's gonna be coming in the first night and just speaking about his organization. They have a lot of um, um, Portland events they've just started in the last year. Um, networking events, they just had last week a uh, like wine and hors d'oeuvres free networking event that um, anybody who's a member or not can go to. So they're just doing a lot of exciting things in the in the area. And Caitlin Burke from Hacienda, that's another commercial kitchen that um, we get clients from. And they the clients they send to us are just really amazing and um, really good at starting their business. Um, and they're opening a new commercial kitchen, I think, in the next month. I was wondering if it was open yet. I believe um, one of our clients is just moving over to it right now, yeah. And then uh, Michael Madigan from Kitchen Crew, who Aaron um, mentioned, they're an amazing place just to go get a tour. They're a really great place to start at because they have um, managers there to help you. So it can be intimidating to go into a commercial kitchen or a restaurant kitchen and you're like, I'm not, I didn't go to culinary school. I don't know how to work in a kitchen with all this equipment. They have these managers there that they'll sit down with you and they'll be like, what are you making? Let's figure out the most efficient way to make your product. Let's streamline your process. Let's find ingredient suppliers for you. And um, you pay for that. You pay a pretty high hourly rate. But it's a great place to start to figure out, how do I make this product? And they have been so generous to offer our clients in our program, um, I think it's an $11 an hour rate to make your product for the trade show. So. To work in a commercial kitchen or produce in a commercial kitchen, you have to get an ODA license. And you have to pay an annual fee for that and get an inspector to approve you in that kitchen. But they will, you can waive that for your trade show samples because you're not selling them. It's free samples. So they think it's an $11 hour rate that they will let you go in and try out making your product. So it's, it's, it's a great experience. Um, Sarah Masoni, of course, comes in and talks about what are the basic food tests you need to do for your product? Is it bricks, your sugar level, moisture content, pH level, what she can do for you there? And I brought some of their brochures so you can see what their services are. But, and she can do your nutrition panel for you. Um, Will Fargo, I mentioned, comes in. Renee Rublé, she's been coming in on the program for years. Um, and she is a graphic designer, brand development manager, who understands food labels. Because you don't want to just go to any graphic designer. You want somebody that understands the FDA guidelines for food. It's really complicated. Um, so you need to make sure they understand what they're creating for you. Uh, we bring in packaging people from WCP Solutions, and they bring like 100 food samples or food packaging examples to the class. And you just get to hold them, pass them around, and they can explain their process of helping clients. Um, Dr. Wells, of course, comes in. We have Denise Braley from Whole Foods. She's a forager. She speaks about what it takes to sell to Whole Foods. And it's not easy. It's, there's a lot of hurdles. Um, of course, Chris and John from New Seasons come in. And they've had cut, you've talked about a few things, but like what it looks like to be commercial ready and then the demoing process at New Seasons. Um, we have Heyman from Earthly Gourmet, who's kind of a smaller local food distributor. And we also have an alumni panel night, some, similar to this, coming to the class. We have JP from Imix Law Group, who's kind of tailoring himself as a food lawyer. So he comes in and talks about, because he loves food, he's a lawyer, he talks about um, product liability, recalls. Um, there's been a, he's going to bring in a case study because there was this um, ingredient recall. They found peanut butter and a whole bunch of imported spices. They found peanut butter proteins in these foods that would not be considered a peanut food. So that's, that was a big recall that happened, I think, two weeks ago. He's going to do a case study on that. Um, Paul Holbrook from Farmers Insurance. I met him at the Northwest Food Processors Association conference, um, and he, he can actually make um, liability insurance 
fun as far as the pro as far as the presentation. You wouldn't think we have the lawyer and the farmers insurance guy come at the same night, and it's like the most laughter that night. Okay. But it's really important to think about these things. Um, Jim Baralt comes in and talks about marketing and public relations, and we also bring in Jill Critchfield from Pacific HR and Julia Fitzgerald from Peace of Mind Bookkeeping, as well as um, we bring in some of our SBDC advisors. We have over 30 of them with a wide range of business expertise, and you. Um, have access to them ongoing. Um, but we bring in um, Noah, who talks about primary and secondary marketing research, as well as um, access to capital. So we try to cover the whole gamut. Some of this information you won't be using right away, but we want to make sure we give it to you so that once you start your business, you're like, oh, that's right. I need to refresh my, I'm going to hire an employee. What did I learn about HR policies? <coughs> Um, this is kind of a recap of our team, um, myself, David, Dr. Wells, and Uri. Um, and then we also have another SBDC advisor, um, Karen, who's, she's working on another program, but she said she could be somebody that we can refer to, but she um, and her husband uh, owned and sold Provista, which is a food distributor here. And so, so she's going to be somebody that we can refer to when it comes to some of those distribution questions. Yeah? It's $1,995. And um, there's a slide I'll show you, but PCC does offer 12 month payment plans to make it a little more feasible for your budget. There were several people in my class that I didn't realize until much later that I stayed in contact with that said that they had scholarships <coughs> through certain programs as well. Yeah, so the Portland Development Commission does offer a limited amount of scholarships to specific demographics. So that's something you can also look into. Yeah? Have you ever worked with anybody who is looking to do social business? Um, so nonprofit or someone who would be like doing your social entrepreneurship but instead of for profit? But food related? Yeah. I don't, Tammy, I don't. So um, from my training side, um, yes, we've had food entrepreneurs who have considered forming a for a nonprofit business. Uh, we don't have any who have yet considered forming a B Corp, which is the newest uh, social entrepreneur uh, focused corporation. Um, however, the Small Business Development Center on the advising side uh, advises only for profit businesses. But to be in training, you can be a nonprofit business, you can be a B Corp, you can be a C Corp, um, you can be not in business yet um, and come into our training program. Yes. I'm just going to make a note that you know about two thousand dollars cost of the program. It's pretty easy going into business and doing business to kind of just accidentally make a mistake that costs that much. So it's, a, it's not really very much. Yeah, we say business. that you know to start your business is it's not cheap, and this is a small amount to gain. Hopefully, to save you a lot of mistakes um, and a lot of time and money that you could be making. You could be spending $5,000 on your first label order and they are not right. They do not meet FDA guidelines and so that could be a big, um, so hopefully we give, we're giving you the information and the access to these contacts so that you can avoid those mistakes. Yes? Have you had students in this program that have the same idea at the same time? Mm. I'd like to answer that question. <laughs> Actually, I'll have Josh ask. That question because as you recall, when you came into class, um, there was a young entrepreneur who sat next to you mm -hmm. who also had a gluten free cookie. Yep. How did you handle that? You know, it was, uh, I mean, it was, it's a very collaborative uh, group and cohort, and everyone's coming at it from. Uh, a different vision and mission, and and even even products that are very similar uh, have to have an element that's unique to them. Otherwise, you'll never survive to market. Uh, so so that sort of a, a scenario really causes you to to look close at both and say, well, what's unique about mine and what's unique about yours, and and then ultimately that helps you in the long run because there's a lot of products out there for most of us anyway that are similar. So it, it what didn't pose a problem. And you're in business and he's not? <laughs> hey, I don't know what she's doing. So, but, um, yeah. So, um, 
Before anybody registers for the program, we do a guided interview. So basically, it's a one-on-one -on -one phone conversation with myself and sometimes Tammy um, to find out, is this program the right fit for you? And are you, is your product the right, in, at the right stage <coughs> for this class? This class is very much a startup um, program. So you need to have a completed recipe. So you can't just say, I have this idea, but I've never made it. We want to make sure mm. you have been making it and it's been producing consistently the recipes done. Um, and you haven't um, done any retail sales. You're not currently selling in any stores. Farmer's market's fine, because if you've been doing farmer's markets, you're getting customer <coughs> feedback, but you haven't yet jumped to retail at the grocery stores or, and or food service or online or anything. Um, and a, a big thing is time to dedicate to the class, to one-on-one -on -one advising. So aside from the weekly class that you meet on Tuesdays from 5 to 8, you'll be assigned a lead advisor. And you'll meet with that person every week to every other week. And in the beginning, it's face-to-face, -face, your meeting, um, and working through your specific product. So in the class, it's kind of everybody um, with your advisor. You're working on your product your challenges, your hurdles, um, and you can be via phone eventually, but in the beginning we really like to meet with you in person. Um, and then have the time to actually do the work, because we're gonna be like, okay, you need to contact these wholesale ingredient suppliers and find out the prices and work on your cost of goods. And next week, once we have that, then we'll move on. So you have to have really the time to do the work. Um, and big, the desire to make your food business idea into a reality. Um, and I also like to ask people in the guided interview, when you think about you and your food business in a year or two from now, what do you envision your daily and weekly life to look like? Are you in the kitchen? Are you out doing demos and sales and promoting your product and distributing? Are you doing it all? Are you, getting a, having, are you trying to find a co-packer? What do you see your life looking like? And that kind of can answer some of your own questions. Um, so this is what you get from the program. It's 14 weeks to get a commercial ready prototype. Um, access to all the food prof professionals you'll need to get commercial ready. An evaluation with new seasons buyers, it, which is invaluable. We get some people that call us and they're like, I'm already in some markets and my product's already ready, but I just heard about those evaluations with new seasons. Can I just do that? And I'm like, it's really a startup program and you're already at the stores. But um, it's, it's amazing. They, we used to call them judges, but they're really evaluators. They're just, they're just great people at new seasons and they're hugely supportive of local food products, so it's, it's invaluable. One-on-one um, -on -one advising, and you get that for the life of your business. Um, it might not be every week, it'll be like once a month, but you get access to all the advisors at the SBDC for the life of your business. So after you've moved on and you're, you've got your sales going, but you come across an HR problem or accounting problem, you can come back and meet with an advisor who specializes in that area. Um, and you get, um, for the life of your business, and even, even if your business isn't still alive, you can come back to this program free at any time and, and take the classes. So last quarter we had a woman who had been in the class, I think three years prior, and she was gonna do this business with a partner and it just didn't work out. And she says, I have a new idea now and I just wanna refresh myself on all the information and she sat through like three quarters of the classes. So you're welcome to do that. Um, you get trade sh the trade show at the end at the Food Innovation Center with exposure to, we invite all the local retail buyers, we invite the public. Um, Sarah arranges for about four or five investors who are looking for our food businesses to come, and we invite the press, and we invite all the alumni who have taken the program to also have booths at this event. It's really, really fun, and it's a great way for you to experience what it's like to be at a trade show, to be giving demos, talking to the public about your product. Um, you get a six-month subscription to foodbizstartup.net, which Dr. Wells developed, and it's got um, all your cost, food costing calculators, all kinds of resources and articles and information on um, food entrepreneurship. All alumni, I said, are welcome to come back. You get supportive learning, learning through your cohort and peers. Um, a lot of our groups start their own Facebook page called GYRM Spring 2014 and they start their own and they just like 
talk with each other and work through problems and meet together at pubs and um, they become really good friends and in the class we encourage you to bring your food product to the class and everybody samples sometimes people bring um, comment cards or little surveys and they're like tell me what you think about this flavor is this one too spicy what do you think of this label and you get feedback from everybody in the class um, access to all the advisors and you get um, tuition covered for the business design series program which will help you start your business plan so so, so Jill mentioned to you and I want just to make sure that you guys heard that that uh, we think it's really important for you to continue your learning journey and so as a graduate of getting recipe to market you can come back to class anytime for as long as you want at no cost but the other thing that we did this year is we bundled one of the next programs that we think um, may be something that you would want to do, which is the business design series, and we're providing that at no cost. Um, because what we're finding is that uh, the 300 plus entrepreneurs who have been through our program, those who have continued with business advising ongoing, those are the ones who have been the most successful, and many of them have gone into our other training programs. So we really want to support our food entrepreneurs in helping it to be as affordable a journey in terms of your lifelong uh, learning as possible. So I'd like to now invite uh, New Seasons, Chris, to come up and tell you a little bit about New Seasons and also a special program that they offer for, um, for entrepreneurs from their store. Um, first, I guess, my, uh, my glowing endorsement of Deeper Recipe to Market. I've, uh, I've been with New Seasons about two and a half years. Uh, been involved in the Get Your Recipe to Market program from the beginning, um, just in the short time I've been here, and I can tell you that it's, uh, it's an invaluable resource for us. Um, I would say that I, I work with a lot of local vendors, and I would say the folks that come through this program versus the ones that try to do it maybe the harder way, maybe they have a basic knowledge, but they need a lot of resource help, and it's really hard to navigate that when you're one person. Um, is that the folks that come through this class come more prepared and I think ready for a different level of success. Um, are they all successful? I think a lot of that depends on yourself and your product and your commitment to it, but I, I would say that everybody I see, and including this group here, it, the, the, there's never a question of passion. I think a lot of times what people find out when they get into it is how, what a commitment it really is. And uh, I've been fortunate to work with Erin um, just from two classes ago, and I've kind of seen the, the path that she's taken, and um, I can tell you that some of the things she shared is very true. I mean, she's had uh, some nights, I'm sure, that have been very sleepless, but, um, <clears throat> you know, she's done, a, uh, she's done a fantastic job. And I would say, you know, what Jill's done with the class, the folks that we see when they come, they're generally ready to go. And what we try to provide is just feedback on if we simply see something that may make your product slightly different or unique because uh, keep in mind we see a lot of different products, a lot of different vendors. So we want to make sure you have the best chance of success. Um, the program that I manage, uh, among other things, at New Seasons is a, a program we started, I guess it's been about a year and a half ago, called Local Finds. And um, it's kind of a complement and works in conjunction with Get Your Recipe to Market, but it's a way for vendors to navigate kind of the daunting task of getting into our stores. Um, Prior to this program, if you had a product and you wanted to bring it in, you had to try to seek out that buyer within our organization. Sometimes you had to do it through a store, sometimes you had to contact our office, and it could be a, a, you know, a difficult task. So this program was really designed to be a way that you could walk into one of our stores, um, pick up this box. In this box is a packet of information that tells you everything you need to know to do business with us. Uh, there's new item and new vendor forms on here, and this is really the start. What happens with this is you take this, the box, you put your sample of product in it, you can deliver it to a store, you can deliver it to our office, and I'm the starting point for all that. So I'm the primary contact. It comes to me, I track everything that comes in, and then really what I do is I become the mentor for you at that point because it goes to our buyers. Um, I do make some decisions because there are some products that come in that are just like, it's so unique, so cool that it really makes sense for us to have it. A lot of it does go to our buyers because there's other things that they may be looking at. So it, it, it can become a process at that point. Um, my point is just to let you know that we've got it. We've got your product that's in good hands and we're gonna try to you know, work through it as fast as we can. But we take this very seriously. We don't just look at products and you know, make a decision based on a taste or, or um, simply the, the packaging of the product. We really try to look at how it fits in and make sure that you have the best <coughs> chance for success. Um, this information is also on our website. If you go to our website and then click on Sell to Us, 
which is one of our links. Um, this packet of information is there in instructions as well, so you can submit those forms online. Um, if I can give you one piece of advice, if you're at a point where you're ready to do this, a lot of the times when I see these things, they come in um, with a sample and just this. And what I'm more interested in, because think of me as your sales rep, is I want to know about you, your passion, how you develop the product, what makes it special, because um, I have to find a way to differentiate you from a lot of other products we see. And, you know, really on a weekly basis right now, I'm probably seeing a half a dozen local vendors come in with different products throughout our store. So it's a, it's a busy place right now. Um, uh, but I, I would say, um, you know, if, if you're thinking about it, if you're waffling on a program like this, it's like, boy, can I afford it? All these other things I could consider my business, I would actually give you the advice to think, can you not afford to do it? Because um, it, it is. You can make one mistake on a label. You can spend a lot of time and get into it and realize that, wow, that $2,000 that I may have spent, um, you know, probably would have been cheap in comparison to all this legwork I'm having to do myself. So um, I fully endorse this program. I know our company feels very fortunate to be involved. Um, you know, with PCC and the Food Innovation Center in, uh, in this whole uh, program, so thanks. Well, Chris, thank you for your yeah. ongoing support yeah. at New Seasons. I've had many emails today from some of you who have said, okay, I'm coming to your program tonight. Is your March program full? Mm -hmm. um, nearly. So then, you know, so what if the March program fills? Um, well, we just register you for the fall. And, um, and then what if that one fills? Well, we just register you for the spring. So we do year-round enrollment um, in terms of this program. Uh, and your registration is just held. It holds your seat. Nothing happens in terms of charges to you. But we want to make sure that your seat is held. But the first most important step is to schedule an appointment with Jill. She'll talk with you over the phone. Um, I recently had a guided interview with a, um, two entrepreneurs, actually, who are bringing a insect uh, based protein product into the Getting Your Recipe to Market program. And I really suggested to them they weren't quite ready. And to which they responded with all of the reasons why they thought they were. And they were right. They shared with me some things that I didn't know that they had already done. And because of that, they were ready. I was going to suggest that they do a little bit more work and come, maybe come in in the fall. They'll actually be in the spring program. It will be our first insect-based <laughs> protein product. I can't wait to try it. They're quite, they're quite purists, actually. I can say that they, they really don't have a high regard for people who make it into a powder. They, they really are. And they're raising their own because they're finding sourcing to be quite difficult. So that just gives you an idea of some of the interesting kind of products that we have in the marketplace. So if you are at all interested in knowing more about the program, there's information on the table. Uh, Jill's happy to do a guided interview with you. Um, but what I want to say in, in close Oh, Jill, the Sign half up sheeters. The, these green sheets if you want to do a guided interview. Okay. Um, just fill these out and leave these here for us. What I'd like to say to you in closing is that I honor your entrepreneurial spirit. Uh, it is something that not everyone understands. If you have a family member who says, you're just weird, <laughs> say thank you, I'm an entrepreneur, and be really proud of that. You know, the small business fuels our economy across the United States, and if, if it were not pe like people such as the ones in the audience today, um, our economy would look completely different. Uh, so I applaud you. I applaud your entrepreneurial spirit, your creativity, and the courage that it takes to be the who you are and to dream to bring your product into the marketplace. Thank you for spending the evening with us. It was great fun. Thank you to our panelists for sharing your stories and your wisdom, and we hope to see you in the near future. Thank you.